Hello, I'm Helen Brown and welcome to the Australia Indonesia Centre and this discussion about the strategic relationship between the two nations in the current testing environment. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners, the Kulin Nations, of the land on which the Centre's Melbourne office is located and also the location from which I am hosting today's webinar. It's also the location for our speaker, Professor Michael Wesley. I acknowledge the Kuwama people on whose lands Senator Penny Wong is joining us from today. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and future. Now, you might wonder why is the Centre going to do a discussion uh, about regional strategy, particularly a centre which focuses on interdisciplinary research and collaboration between scientists and the two countries, Australia and Indonesia. Well, we also have some other important roles and those include talking about contemporary Indonesia and the relationship between the two countries and current issues around it. Our aim is to increase understanding and to find ways to improve the bilateral relationship, but also build those stronger connections connections which are so important to our current situation and our future. Of course, Indonesia, you know, the, the biggest economy in Southeast Asia, 260 million people uh, and a country with President Jokowi in his second term. We're joined today by the Senator, the Honourable Penny Wong, Leader of the Opposition in the Senate and Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, no doubt well known to many of you. She's been the Senator in South Australia since 2002. And, <clears throat> excuse me, she's currently Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, a Cabinet Minister in the Rudd and Gillard governments from 2007 to 2013, and she gained her Bachelor of Arts and Law degree from the University of Adelaide prior to entering federal parliament. Senator Wong work, worked as a lawyer and political advisor. We're also joined from Jakarta by Dr. Phillips Vermonte, the Executive Director at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, and a alumni of the Australia Indonesia Centre's Leaders Program. It's an absolute delight to have him join us today. He joined the Centre in 2001. He received his Master's of Arts degree in International Studies from the Department of Politics at the University of Adelaide in Australia, of course, in 2001 funded by an AusAid scholarship. He obtained his PhD in political science at the Northern Illinois University in the United States. And he's one of the founding members of the policy research network called PROPEP. And uh, of course, one of uh, the, sorry, one of the, uh, <laughs> A contributor to Metro TV and actually contributes to the Jakarta Post and Tempo magazine. My apologies, I had all these messages just pop up on my screen then um, when I was trying to give Dr Phillips his due worth. And uh, finally, we will be joined by Professor Michael Wesley, who's the Deputy Vice-Chancellor International at the University of Melbourne. He is the, uh, well, he has extensive experience in international strategy and relations and has worked in higher education, government and the private sector, formerly the ANU Professor of International Affairs and Dean of the College of Asia and the Pacific. And uh, he is, of course, an expert in strategic affairs and the politics of state building interventions. So there's a good summary of our guests. Uh, important to do because this is obviously a matter that needs great expertise to talk about complex uh, and interesting and challenging and I thank all our guests for coming on board to do that. So let's get into it. Uh, we have uh, questions from the audience already and we will go to those at some point but Senator Penny Wong I wanted to go to you first and it's really hard to ignore some of the news coming out today where we um, have heard about Australian ships being tracked by Chinese ships in islands in the South China Sea, islands that are claimed by Beijing but contested by others. Uh, what are we to make of this and how does it show that the tensions within that regional sphere uh, have not abated at all, despite the impact of the coronavirus pandemic? Uh, well, I think on the contrary, I think the pandemic has uh, increased 
the competition and increase the contestation within our region. Can I say first, I apologise for the technical difficulties when I first came on, but it's good to be with you all. Um, and thanks uh, to uh, Philip's, good to see you, and to Michael for um, uh, joining um, uh, in this today. Um, and Helen, I appreciate the question, and I, I did anticipate that this might come up, but perhaps not first. Uh, Look, I think the pandemic has heightened competition in the region. I think it's heightened the strategic competition between the US and China. Um, uh, we are seeing a much more assertive China and we are seeing the US uh, very clearly identifying China as a strategic competitor and we've seen an escalation in, in, in a hardening of rhetoric. Um, the most recent and, and concerning manifestation of this is obviously the encounter that's been reported. I obviously haven't been briefed on it, but uh, I've, I've read the public reports. Uh, these sorts of interactions aren't new, but they are a marker of the more contested region. And I'd probably make a couple of points arising out of it. The first is uh, it's a reminder that we do live now in a, in a riskier world uh, and in a region which is uh, a greater focal point of competition. Uh, I think that gives rise to a number of imperatives. Uh, one of them is uh, the acceptance of a, a more self-reliant and ambitious foreign policy, uh, given the, the more risky strategic and difficult strategic environment in which we find ourselves. And the second, and relevantly, particularly for this seminar, uh, is the importance of working in our region uh, with allied nations and with aligned nations, and Indonesia is critical to that. Uh, we want a, a region that reflects uh, the interests we have. Uh, we share those interests with Indonesia, we share those interests with other nations in the region, and we have an interest in a stable and prosperous and non-hegemonic region uh, where sovereignty is, is respected. We have an interest in a region uh, in which uh, rules and norms, international rules and norms, do guide behaviour, and that they include the, the law of the sea. Now, I, I don't pretend any of that is easy to uh, um, attain, uh, but we need uh, to prioritise working with our region and particularly Southeast Asia at this time. Thank you. Thanks, Senator, for answering that. You may not have expected it, but uh, as always, you do have some good insight into what's going on uh, and the different threads to that sort of activity. I'm sure we will come back to that in another way. I'm curious now, though, I'd like to go to Dr. Phillips Vermonte. Uh, Phillips, just to get uh, a landscape view from you, I guess, of where Indonesia sits with this kind of tension in the region. How is it dealing with the assertiveness of China and, and what political stance is it taking? All right. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Helen, and, and thank you for inviting me for this uh, meeting. I think the, the traditional position of Indonesia with the free and active foreign policy is that uh, Indonesia uh, would want to have a region free of uh, interference from any uh, major powers. And we would like to have a, a region, Southeast Asian region, that is uh, filled with uh, cooperation rather than competition. And then the, if you look at the history of ASEAN, for example, it's, it's coming out of conflicts and then uh, it was uh, kind of a, a experience that the Southeast Asian countries uh, had gone through in the past. And then the, in the 70s, 80s and 90s, then we tried uh, very hard to keep uh, the region safe and peaceful so that we can uh, develop. Uh, uh, mind you as well that this is the region where uh, all the members are developing countries. So uh, I think uh, uh, Indonesia's traditional position is that we want to have uh, cooperation with any country on the uh, mutual respect and then the non-interference uh, uh, principle. And uh, we would like to have, uh, you know, if there is a major powers competition, we, we don't want to be dragged into that kind of competition. And, and, and with regard to, of course, and uh, now it is rather more difficult because China, uh, I think, is more or less in the region. Uh, uh, compared to the past uh, uh, geopolitical competition with Soviet Union and, and the United States, where uh, Southeast Asia might be uh, seen as a proxies. But now uh, China is here. Uh, many countries have a long relationship with, with China, you know, historically, uh, historically, culturally, and so on. So it's, it's rather more difficult now to manage uh, you know, the tension between the major powers and of course uh, the consequences of the rise of China in the region. So Indonesia is walking a thin line there. Uh, 
you know, uh, not only about uh, maintaining the regional uh, peace and security, but also uh, there are, <clears throat> I think, implications as well to domestic politics in, in, uh, given the, the nature of our relationship with China. Mm. Thank you, Phillips. Appreciate that. And then I'll go to our next guest, Dr. Professor Michael Wesley. Apologies. Because when we were talking, Michael, you know, this was one of your concerns that this great power play that's going on in the region between the US and China was taking some of the focus away from the importance of building those other strategic alliances that our two guests have just spoken about. Thanks, Helen. Um, and uh, and great to great to be here, Penny Phillips. Hello, um, good to see you. Um, for any members of Victoria Police who are in the audience today, I'm not actually sitting on Melbourne's beautiful South Lawn without a face mask. This is a Zoom background, so please don't send me a fine notice. Um, look, I, I would concur with uh, what Penny and Phillips have said. You know, there there is a growing strategic competition and. I think it's absolutely the case that strategic competition has deepened during this crisis. But I think something really significant has happened as well. I think that both uh, the leadership credentials of both the United States and China have been damaged by the COVID crisis and by their behaviours in the, in the COVID crisis. And I think what that does is provides real opportunities for countries such as Australia and Indonesia along with uh, Japan, Korea, other Southeast Asian countries also, uh, to really step in and start to fill the diplomatic void. I think what the, what the COVID crisis has done has to some extent receded that idea that either the United States or China would assert you know, it, its primacy in the region and that would be the region's future or that we would have some sort of bipolar arrangement with some uh, Indo-Pacific countries siding with the United States and some siding with China. I think that's very much receded now because of the damage to their leadership credentials. Um, and my sense is that there's now much greater room for smaller countries to start to reconstruct a multilateral vi vision of, of, of the region which of course must, must include China and the United States, but to start to reconstruct it on, along the lines of institutions and understandings that will serve the interests of smaller countries, the interests of middle-sized countries as well. And, uh, and, and I think this is a real strategic opportunity for our countries at the moment. And I, I would suggest that this should be the number one foreign policy priority that we have at the moment. Thanks, Michael. Interesting points. And, and I will continue on from what you've said. I just wanted to give you an idea of how important these questions are to uh, our audience today. Um, we had two, we invite questions beforehand and we had uh, a couple come in um, yesterday about this particular issue and I'll just get them to put up a slide on that so that you can read them as well. So you can see there are two questions uh, from Bart Ristian and Ibu Felia. Uh, and we, I put them up, I mean we have other questions from the audience but it just gives you an idea that you know these questions are being asked. Michael picking up uh, from your point, I'll perhaps go to the Senator. Senator, you mentioned that COVID has intensified the battle, whereas Michael says, Professor Wesley says, it is an opportunity though too for middle powers to step in. Could you perhaps, do you agree with that? Do you think this does in fact present an opportunity for us? Uh, I think, I think Michael, Michael's language is often more um, positive and optimistic than mine. I, I should probably take a, I should probably try and become <laughs> less half glass half full. I mean, I think we're, we're making the same point, aren't we? Uh, I think the point we're making is that we need to not, we, Australia, and I would argue um, or suggest Indonesia too, uh, we, we, we need to get out of the binary of US-China competition as the, the, the um, central framework by which we understand the region. And, uh, you know, we've already chosen in a sense in that we're, we're a US ally, but that's not the end of the matter. And, and Michael's point really, uh, and, and Philip, so is, is 
uh, aspects of the same point I was seeking to meet, which is we have an opportunity uh, and I think an obligation uh, to uh, build and support and renew the region that we want. And in the absence of doing so, then uh, you know, we, we, we become what I described as collateral uh, in, in the strategic competition between the US and China. So, uh, I, and it is, it is a difficult proposition. It, it is difficult to, for Australia, it, I, would, I would anticipate difficult for ASEAN nations uh, who have, we have known a very different world. Um, but the, in the absence of stepping up in that way, in the absence of uh, seeking to make the region in the manner that we seek, it will be made for us and it will be made for us in ways that we do not seek. Uh, so I think the, my first point really is, I suppose in some ways an acceptance of, 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 of that opportunity and that choice. Uh, we have to be, um, from Australia's perspective, we have to be more self-reliant and more ambitious and we have to recognise that working with the region to ensure the region that we want with the characteristics we want uh, is really the only path to, to, to the outcomes that certainly Australia wants and I would argue Indonesia wants and in the, in the absence of doing it, so it will, be, it will be made for us. So yes, I do agree with Michael, it is an opportunity. Um, uh, and to take that opportunity, we have to, from I think Australia's perspective, uh, as I said, we have to generate and work for greater alignment and greater cooperation with nations, including Indonesia. Uh, and I think that requires us to ensure we have greater capability, a greater you know, Indonesian um, and Southeast Asian language and cultural capability. And we also, I think, need to make sure in our own minds, we move from, from them to us and generate that sense of shared purpose. Uh, mm. And, you know, I think, I think that is central to cooperation. And that's part of the problem, I guess, isn't it? The understanding that Australia has of Indonesia. Uh, plenty of research to show that there's not a great understanding of contemporary Indonesia. Uh, language learning has gone down. We, uh, you, Senator, you've even written about the concerns around Achichis, the program mm. which puts, you know, students into Indonesia and gives them that first-hand experience. Do you think the government's focus is on Indonesia much? We've had a defence <laughs> paper recently. <laughs> well, I think defence capability is important, but it, you know, let's actually deliver it rather than just announce it. Uh, and whilst I don't want to be too partisan on these sorts of events because people don't, you know, it's not really what you all signed up for. I mean, I, I, I think that uh, you have to ensure, from Australia's perspective, in addition to enhanced defence capability, we need more cooperation, we need more diplomatic cooperation, we need more ways in which we engender um, alignment and, and, and cooperation. Uh, we need much more cooperation on economic recovery. Um, so my criticism of the government is, I don't understand why we wouldn't be protecting and preserving our Indonesian language capability and building on it. I don't understand why we have funded a, our Pacific step up with the Southeast Asian step down. I don't understand why we've seen an 80% reduction in funding to our health programs in Indonesia ahead of the pandemic. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I don't understand why we are not at the forefront of regional cooperation uh, to buttress the Southeast Asian, uh, the ASEAN economies, particularly Indonesia, at a time where they are confronting a pandemic uh, and an economic and potentially financial uh, crisis, which is of the size that it is. Uh, we, we have not just a, a, an ethical interest in Indonesia's economic well-being, we have a very strong self-interest for the reasons Michael uh, has already articulated so persuasively. Uh, and we don't seem to have that kind of economic leadership from this government currently. Uh, we did see it uh, in the GFC from Kevin Rudd. And, and to be fair, we saw it, I think, from, from John Howard during the Asian financial crisis, where there was a recognition of, of our shared interests. And we ought to find that same sense of shared purpose and, and resolve now. Thank you. And I've just had a text from someone who's watching to remind me that a Chichis is just one program of many that uh, encourages Australian students to go into Indonesia and hopefully vice versa. So um, totally acknowledge that. Uh, a lot of good work being done. But Dr. Vermonte, if I can go to you, 
we are talking now about what Australia can do with its regional neighbour. What do you think Indonesia expects from Australia at this point? Right. I think <clears throat> um, as far as the relations uh, with Australia is concerned, uh, and, uh, and in general in Southeast Asia, Australia's relation with Southeast Asia, I think uh, I agree with uh, Senator Wong that uh, China, uh, US-China rivalry should not define our relations because there are so many things going on uh, between the region and Australia, between Indonesia and Australia as well, and also Indonesia with China and Southeast Asia with China. Now, now it seems that uh, at least uh, for Indonesia, uh, I don't know about Australia, the thing has been focused more on the on, on the problem in the South China Sea, and uh, <clears throat> that uh, becomes the the main focus and attention uh, towards the, the behavior of China. Uh, we know that uh, China and ASEAN, uh, actually as far as the South China Sea is concerned, uh, had already agreed uh, the single draft negotiating text uh, for, for the, the, the COC uh, on South China Sea. And then uh, it is expected uh, to be completed at uh, next year, 2021. But of course, uh, the increasing uh, assertiveness of China in South China Sea and the surrounding areas uh, the proliferation of maritime militia, uh, illegal fishing, and then the construction of military facilities, that uh, become uh, kind of a sign for uh, many Southeast Asian countries, including Indonesia, that uh, uh, China's behavior needs to be uh, somehow uh, tamed. And then uh, that would make the, the progress of the negotiating the COC uh, be more difficult. And then the, even so, with the more uh, 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 activities by other external powers in the region, uh, uh, that also complicate the, uh, the, the, the situation. Now, I think uh, what we can expect from, uh, uh, from Australia, as far as this uh, issue of South China Sea is concerned and China's rise is concerned, I think, uh, number one, once again, the, uh, we should not be defined by, by this because uh, uh, other areas of cooperation are, are really possible. Number two, uh, you know, Southeast Asia, you know, in the past 20 years uh, have been, some Southeast Asian countries have been aspiring to be more democratic. Mm. And then the, we know sometimes in the past uh, relationship between uh, Indonesia and, and Australia sometimes, you know, become uh, problematic because uh, different culture, different political system, that we are uh, both having, but now more or less Indonesia is uh, a more democratic country, uh, or more or less similar to Australia. And then the, some of these uh, questions about, you know, conflicts, uh, human rights abuse, and so on now can be uh, discussed more openly and more freely. Uh, of course, uh, not to the extent yet we want it to be, but uh, I think uh, some of the cultural uh, hurdles uh, that exist in the past between Indonesia and Australia, uh, it seems to me at least now uh, it's no longer uh, there. So we have uh, more uh, shared views about uh, governance, about uh, politics uh, probably in, in Southeast Asia and about you know, principles that uh, we agreed on. Uh, uh, but maybe uh, because once again, uh, uh, pandemic, uh, with the pandemic in mind, that uh, now the countries in Southeast Asia face uh, enormous challenges uh, to revive the economy and then uh, to keep uh, you know their people safe. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, if I understood correctly uh, uh, from Senator Wong's statement, uh, at the time when these Southeast Asian countries uh, uh, need uh, assistance. Uh, from outside uh, uh, the region uh, in terms of uh, uh, keeping up their health system uh, uh, updated, uh, keeping the, helping the government with uh, social provision, social assistance, and so on. These Southeast Asian countries, including Indonesia, now need uh, more uh, multilateral forums, uh, multilateral uh, organization that could you know, discuss, uh, work, and help and work together with, with, with these countries because, you know, China and, and, and United States, uh, as we know, they, they, they more or less no longer interested in multilateral organization. Now, uh, I also agree with uh, then uh, Professor Weasley 
that uh, middle-sized country or, or if you like uh, middle power now uh, needs to be uh, playing uh, more uh, active roles and that includes Indonesia and Australia. Australia has been a good example of uh, benevolent, if I may, uh, middle power, uh, helping countries uh, not only in Southeast Asia but far from uh, your border, uh, uh, playing your role as a, a middle power, helping countries dealing with human security, uh, you know, that uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, big power would not be interested in uh, helping. But Australia has been at the forefront of this kind of approach uh, in the past 20 years. And I think it's been uh, well uh, respected in, in Southeast Asia. So my point would be Australia has a lot to offer for, for, for the region. And then uh, I think Indonesia and, and Southeast Asia should welcome uh, Australia's uh, you know, uh, participation in, the, in, in Southeast Asia. Well, thank you, Professor Michael Wesley. Do you think Australia has a strategy for its alliance, so to speak, with Indonesia and for working with nations in Southeast Asia at a time, as you say, uh, the coronavirus pandemic has hit countries hard economically and there uh, is a need to have strong regional architecture? Look, I think if, if, if there is a strategy, it's been a, a fairly narrowly economic strategy and it's been focused very much around getting the, the trade agreement with Indonesia up and running. But I do think it's got to be a broader strategy than, than we have at the moment. And I would very much um, endorse and agree with uh, Penny's point about uh, the level of aid that has collapsed to Southeast Asia at a really inopportune time. Uh, this, Southeast Asia is, a, is our backyard. It, it, it is a place where we need to start to uh, build some real diplomatic capital at a really unstable time. Can I say this, Helen, that if you look at the history of Australia-Indonesia relations, uh, Australia and Indonesia have been strongest when they've been working together on larger projects. I'll give you a couple of examples. Back in uh, 1992, when Paul Keating uh, proposed a, uh, an APEC leaders meeting um, against some fairly significant opposition uh, in the region, uh, he was able to partner with President Suharto back then and carry the region uh, to set up the APEC leaders' meetings. Um, about a decade after that, uh, the Howard government came together with the government of President Yudhoyono in, uh, in Indonesia to start to develop the Bali process for uh, addressing issues such as uh, people smuggling and, uh, and transnational terrorism. So those are examples of where we work really effectively together. Uh, we have uh, uh, currently in Indonesia um, a, um, a president, uh, President Jokowi, who is obviously well disposed to Australia. He broadly shares our international values and we should be working really hard on building uh, that sort of relationship uh, with uh, President Jokowi because you know, this is his second term and we don't know what sort of, you know, who will, who will uh, succeed President Jokowi uh, when the Indonesian elections next occur. Uh, it's a real opportunity for us to develop a shared uh, agenda and there are ample opportunities to find common cause. Uh, once uh, the COVID crisis has passed, there will be an enormous amount of regional rebuilding to be done. The, the impacts on economies, the impacts on, on societies, on health systems has been uh, huge. And uh, what we need is a massive reconstruction effort. Uh, this is something that can bring Australia, uh, Indonesia and our other Asian neighbours together like never before and really give us a platform for a new age of uh, collaboration and cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. Senator Wong, what are some steps that the government could then take or could um, the Department of Foreign Affairs take to make this kind of, uh, or make these suggestions happen? I, Michael has mentioned that, you know, we need a big project, we need something to work on. Mm -hmm. Do Does the government have the capacity for that at the moment? We've seen that Indonesia is being very hard hit by the coronavirus and there are many areas for assistance that could be possible. Uh, we've seen 
aid dropped in the region. Unfortunately, aid is often equated as charity rather than a chance to find a way to collaborate. I mean, what could the government do uh, right now to make a shift in the direction that's being spoken about? Uh, well, I think we could, um, well, where, where would we start? You could start by uh, restoring uh, and renewing some of your development assistance programs. You could start by uh, engaging with Indonesia around economic recovery and working out what are the ways in which Australia can assist, whether it's in terms of galvanising a multilateral response uh, or bilaterally. Um, one of the suggestions I made in a recent essay I published was a regional pandemic initiative. Uh, it seems to me that uh, you know, we've got previous experience in terms of cooperating with Indonesia around counter-terrorism. Uh, we we can, uh, there's an analogous model which we could put in place in terms of regional pandemic prevention, which, you know, will, will, is a continued priority. Uh, and it, it, I, I think also, uh, in many ways, rhetorically, um, uh, making sure that at leader level, we demonstrate our commitment to the relationship is of the depth and breadth that Michael describes. Uh, I, I, I don't hear from um, my counterpart or from the Prime or Mr. Morrison uh, the sort of language that we, we heard from President Jokowi when he came and addressed the parliament. Uh, and uh, it was an extraordinarily warm um, uh, address. It was an, an address which really demonstrated where um, um, Indonesia placed Australia uh, and I think we should be reciprocating that. Um, uh, in addition, of course, uh, the, the Indonesian language, Indonesian capability issues that we've described earlier. So, so the steps are well known. Dr Vermonte, do you think Indonesia is looking to Australia to create some kind of partnership to get through this time and perhaps forge a new way forward for the region? Right, I think uh, if I may uh, share my view on this, uh, President Jokowi, I think, place, places uh, Australia as uh, one of his, uh, you know, uh, priorities. Uh, as we uh, completed the Australia-Indonesia Comprehensive Economic Partnership, uh, you know, uh, not long ago, and uh, President Jokowi uh, domestically uh, have been criticized for not <clears throat> showing, uh, you know, enough appetite for foreign policy. And then the uh, people have been <laughs> complaining about this and that he's very inward looking and so on, not very much interested in uh, what's going on outside Indonesia. But uh, at one point, uh, if I may share, <clears throat> uh, he said that uh, he... Uh, uh, divide his time, 90% uh, for domestic uh, issues and 10% for uh, international issues. And then when, uh, when he was asked what are in those 10% uh, of his time uh, in foreign policy, uh, in foreign relations, he said at that time before the SIPA uh, was completed, he said, you know, among that 10%, number one on the list is the completion of uh, Australia-Indonesia SIPA. So, you know, from this, I think and then uh, secondly, also on the uh, uh, RCEP. So <clears throat> what I'm saying is that he is very much interested in, you know, regional economic platform, uh, regional economic cooperation, be they with Australia or with uh, other uh, countries. But uh, economic cooperation uh, it has always been his uh, uh, one priority. Number two, if I may add into what Senator Wong uh, already mentioned, uh, as far as Indonesia and Australian relations is concerned, I agree, you know, uh, economic uh, recovery would be uh, one of the area that uh, not only Indonesia, but uh, all, all countries uh, need it. And uh, Australia can play a very uh, much constructive role in this. Uh, but pandemic is, pandemic is just one big challenge that the world uh, has to face. Uh, there might be other issues and a very important ones. Not long before the pandemic, we all talk about the environmental challenge, climate change and so on. And Indonesia and Australia certainly, I think, can cooperate in this area more. Uh, you know, Indonesia always suffer from, uh, for example, forest fire every year that took uh, a lot of uh, economic and, uh, you know, uh, life uh, uh, consequences in Indonesia. You just suffered from the bushfire that uh, devastated uh, you know, Australia uh, pretty severely, but uh, that 
uh, you know, can be one area where Indonesia and Australia can cooperate, uh, you know, on a, on a very concrete term. And, uh, and, and there are many other lists uh, we can go and on, uh, on and on, but uh, I would say this economic, <clears throat> uh, regional economic cooperation or uh, constructing platform for economic re recovery would be one. And secondly, also uh, the other issue, uh, the big elephant in the room is uh, climate change. Thank you, Philip. So I'll go to Professor Michael Weasley and I, I, Dr. Vermont, I asked you, what does Indonesia expect from Australia? We've had a question from the audience and it's a fair one. I'll put it to you, Professor Weasley. What does Australia expect from Indonesia? I'm not sure we can, we can expect anything from a neighbour, but uh, certainly I think the sort of relationship we want with Indonesia is a very positive and um, broad and multifaceted uh, relationship. Um, Indonesia is of crucial geopolitical importance to Australia. Um, most of our shipping, uh, most of our trade uh, traverses uh, the Indonesian archipelago in some ways. Um, a lot of our air travel goes over the Indonesian landmass. Um, you can just imagine the uh, impacts on Australia uh, if we had a really bad relationship with Indonesia. I think we've been extraordinarily lucky in, in being able to build, uh, uh, since 1966, a strong and pragmatic uh, and, uh, and broad relationship with uh, the, the, the Indonesian governments that have developed over time. But I think there's a lot more to be done. Um, as we can see, uh, the periodic downturns in bilateral relations, usually um, uh, related to um, uh, areas of domestic policy or transnational issues between us, show how fragile that relationship can be. And so I think there's a lot more we can do. I think uh, the, the two economies uh, could benefit from becoming much more interdependent. I think uh, much greater flows of investment between the two countries uh, would do a great deal of good. And I think uh, growing people to people links, um, the willingness of uh, Australians to go and study and live in Indonesia and the willingness of Indonesians to come and live and study in Australia uh, will have a, a really strong effect on further building those relationships. Thanks, Professor, and thanks for all your questions. We're getting quite a lot through. Now, I am looking at them, and uh, there are similarities between them, so I'm just trying to pick off a few that are relevant and a bit different, and um, we will keep referring back to your questions, and we have a few more coming up soon. Um, Senator Wong, you raised before an article that you've written recently, which looked at these issues. Uh, your concern is that, you know, as you say, this is an opportunity to create something, some pandemic regional response. Can you perhaps, uh, I'll give you a bit of a chance to present your vision here, because the questions that are coming in are, well, how do we actually make this work? And then Professor Wesley, I'd like to go to you to talk about, we have seen cuts to DFAT funding though. So, you know, that has to be included in the mix as well. But Senator, how, how, does, this, how does this response work? What's the ideal situation? Well, I don't think the government should have been cutting funding to DFAT at this point. Let's make that clear to start with. But look, I wrote, um, uh, one of the benefits, I suppose, of, of being locked down is you get a lot of time to think and you get a bit of time to write, which as a politician, uh, you get much less of that than, than I'd like. And I had to do a couple of, two lots of two weeks of isolation um, after two different sessions of parliament. Uh, uh, and I tried to use the time to write this essay for Australian Foreign Affairs. Uh, and the reason I wanted to do it was it, was, it seemed important to me for... Um, in my own mind and for the Labor Party, but more generally to try and uh, articulate on paper some of what I was observing and reading about uh, in terms of the effect of, of the pandemic. So uh, it's an essay that is entitled The End of Orthodoxy. And what, what it essentially, its diagnosis is as I started, which is uh, the pandemic has made the world a, a more difficult and riskier place. Uh, it's uh, accelerated the unravelling or the 
the disruption of the global order we've known since World War II. Uh, we, it's accelerated and intensified the competition between the great powers with our region being a focal point. Uh, it's weakened multilateralism uh, and uh, all of the, uh, and it's brought nationalism to the fore. Uh, at a time where humanity should have been cooperating to confront this common threat. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the response to the pandemic has been greater mistrust and greater competition. Uh, and the cost of, of that will be measured in human lives and increased poverty. And that's, a great, I think, a great sadness for us all. Uh, what, is, what do we do about it? Uh, well, th th these aren't, you know, this is not an easy um, um, task. Uh, you know, we can, we can, it's probably not that hard to discuss it, but it's, it is harder to do it. Uh, and I, I make a few points about that. I think the first is we have to recognise what is happening, that we are in a much riskier world than we have known since the, uh, that since World War Two, and, uh, and that, that creates, uh, you know, an imperative for Australia. I think we have to be more self-reliant. We have to accept that. I think we have to be more ambitious. We need to focus on our region. We need to invest in our region, whether that is through ODA or through the sorts of engagement that both Phillips and, and Michael have been talking about. Uh, I think we have to renew, uh, put our shoulder to the wheel to renew multilateralism, which does not have a great power uh, advocate in the, or, or underwriter in the way we have previously known. Uh, and as substantial or middle powers, I think we both Indonesia and Australia share an interest in a, a multilateral system which is effective. It won't be effective without our, our, our engagement. Uh, we can't rely on others to make it more effective. Um, I think we have to, uh, we're going to have to continue to navigate the great power competition. Uh, we will have to work closely with allied and aligned nations in our region and more broadly. Uh, and we're going to have to exercise some true leadership. Uh, more strategy and less politics in terms of our foreign policy and how we view the world. Uh, and we're going to have to invest in, in our own capability. So that's a summary of it. Uh, and I think it is important, many of the questions I've been, I've been reading uh, as they've been coming up as well. Uh, I think really a lot of them are searching for the same um, uh, answers or, or are, are grappling with the same issue we all are, which is what does this world look like? And how do we ensure that we have a region and a world uh, which uh, which are consistent with Australia and Indonesia's interests? And really, the simple answer to that is we're going to have to step up um, because uh, if we don't, um, I think you know, that that path is a path that is much harder for both our countries. Uh, you asked a question earlier, which was an interesting one, which is what does Australia want from, from Indonesia? And I've been sort of thinking about that sitting here. Uh, and I, I made the point to start with that I think we, we always have to be careful as Australia to recognise that we need Indonesia much more than Indonesia actually needs us, ultimately, and in the long term. And, and we have to come... So a lot of people don't think about it that way, though, do they? I, I, it's, no, it's a no. hard sell to the, for the Australian government, to the Australian public. I understand that, but you know, if you look at population size and economic trajectory, uh, and as Michael pointed out, the, the central geopolitical and strategic um, position that both geographically, but also in terms of um, the ASEAN nations, the central role Indonesia has, we do need Indonesia uh, to uh, be uh, aligned. We need Indonesia, Indonesia to be economically strong and prosperous. Uh, and we need Indonesia to be a central player in the way in which the region is governed. Uh, and that is a hard ask of Indonesia at this time uh, because of the economic position Indonesia is in, because of the pandemic, but also it is a change. You know, Phillips was talking about the history uh, of how Indonesia saw itself in the region uh, and you know, what, it, what uh, we are encouraging is Indonesia to take a leadership role at a time when great powers are taking a very different sort of role. Uh, so um, your point about, you know, it's a hard sell to the Australian public, uh, I think that's true. Uh, part of how we start perhaps is, is, is perhaps how we, how we talk about Indonesia and how we talk with Indonesia uh, rather than telling them um, what we think they should be doing. Professor Wesley, your thoughts on the cuts to DFAT to the diplomatic service? It's obviously an extremely difficult time for the Australian government. 
they're dealing with a lot of extra expenses. They've had to make cuts across some of their departments, no doubt. Do you think this will have much of an impact on Australia's ability to engage regionally? Oh, look, it's, it's the latest step in a long-term decline and running down of our diplomatic capability, Helen. And the point I would make is this, that every country in the world seeks to shape its international environment in its own interests. And it has a number of levers for doing that. Um, and the levers uh, need to be uh, simultaneously strong and used uh, in support of each other. Otherwise, they will not be maximally effective. Um, what we've seen over many years now has been the systematic reduction of our diplomatic capacity and resources, the systematic reduction of our aid delivery, um, and uh, over time, the increasing investment in our defence capabilities. Uh, so we are doing exactly the wrong thing if we think we are going to be able to shape our region in our interests. Uh, the fact is that the last country that tried to shape the region using purely military means was Imperial Japan, and look what happened to them. Uh, the fact is that uh, diplomacy and aid cost a lot less than do military weapons, and they are much more effective in achieving real diplomatic outcomes for Australia. We are disinvesting in exactly the wrong uh, arms of our foreign policy, and, uh, and we are doing it at a time that we cannot afford to do it. That's a very clear response that, yes, there will be an impact. And uh, as Penny Wong has pointed out, there are calls across many quarters for the region to find a way to work together, to build alliances that are strong to get past the coronavirus. Is that a conversation that comes up in Jakarta, Dr Vermonte, that this is actually a time of opportunity as well? I think uh, Indonesia too needs to invest more on, on international relations and foreign policy, you know, put more resources, uh, you know, as uh, <clears throat> Australia is now uh, discussing about the cut uh, of funding to your DFAT and so on. But uh, Indonesia, uh, I would say, uh, have not really been investing much on, uh, you know, on, on, on foreign affairs. And now I think it's time for Indonesia to, uh, to do that because now Indonesia is a G20 country. We've been traditionally seen as a, as a leader in Southeast Asia and, and so on. Uh, Indonesia just set up uh, what we call, uh, you know, Indonesia aid. Uh, cannot be compared with the house aid, but uh, it's a start that uh, now we are thinking, if we think about ourselves as a middle power, then one measurement would be whether we can help the region or whether we can help other countries. And, and Indonesia is start thinking about that just before the pandemic. Now, you know, the, the pandemic, of course, uh, will, will change a lot of this. Uh, now resources uh, are shrinking and uh, it will be a very difficult time. But uh, then the, if we are thinking about uh, the, the natural approach of a mid-sized country like Indonesia, multilateralism is, is, is the way to go. Uh, I agree with Senator Wong. And then, the, you know, with Australia, I think Indonesia I, I can play a much larger, much larger role. Uh, this time, you know, the, the U.S., uh, we cannot trust the U.S., so to speak, <laughs> under, uh, oh, forgive me, but, uh, you know, under the, the President Trump, uh, he does not believe in multilateralism. And then uh, China as well with the aggressive behavior in, in South China Sea. So essentially, you know, we cannot trust the two uh, major powers. Uh, they are uh, belligerent, so to speak. So uh, the thinking, I think, in Jakarta is that then we should rely on our own regional organization, which is ASEAN. And then, the, then we should strengthen, uh, you know, ASEAN as an organization to be fully functional, to be able to address the problem of the region uh, economically or uh, pandemic. We have not seen uh, too much cooperation uh, among ASEAN member countries, you know, in, in dealing with the pandemics or, you know, there are meetings, but, you know, uh, in the end, it's about uh, we are taking care of ourselves. And uh, I, I believe that uh, Indonesia should use ASEAN uh, with the help of dialogue partners like Australia and then the uh, ASEAN plus three so that ASEAN become um, a, a focal point for cooperation. 
uh, in which Indonesia can play a, a, a leadership role there. Dr. Vermont, I'm going to stay with you because we have a question from the audience which relates a little bit to what you were saying. Uh, you said earlier that the competition between China and the United States uh, during this COVID era will have an impact on domestic politics in Indonesia. The question is, in what way could you elaborate further and what are the implications for the Australia-Indonesia relationship? Well, uh, you know, uh, we've been... We've been uh discussing and we've been uh, talking about the, the consequences of, 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 of China's rise. And now with this pandemic, I think it uh, will be even more. Uh, to give you one example, of course now we need more investment uh, to, for the economic recovery. And then the, I, I would say one country that is still ready to invest, you know, either from B2B or G2G would be China, <coughs> uh, given the size of the economy. And then uh, we know uh, we've been uh, we've been suffering from from the debacles of a Chinese worker, for example. So in the time uh, in the difficult time, the public would be more sensitive, you know, this, to this issue of, of, of foreign workers, especially the ones coming from China. That's a uh, you know one uh, one example of how this pandemic would uh, exacerbate the, the already sensitive sensitivities of Indonesia-China relations. The other example would be now as the countries are competing to find vaccines and uh, they are forming clusters of research and so on. Indonesia is now with the cluster, uh, in the cluster with China, you know. And, you know, if these competitions become uh, uh, more severe among countries and one vaccine is, is, uh, uh, is found uh, it's, and it's not uh, coming from the groups that, for example, China is, is leading, then it will be a difficult issue because once vaccine is, 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 is found, you know, the priority would be given to the countries who, who, who found them. And then the, that would be uh, also a sensitive issues. Uh, you know, the government would be blamed and, and so on and so forth. So there are many other ways. Uh, I think, uh, you know, China, China has always been a sensitive issue in Indonesia. Uh, given the history in 1965, uh, China was seen as the supporter of this Indonesian Communist Party, and we froze the relationship for 20, more than 20 years. Uh, and as a result, uh, Indonesians do not understand China, and Chinese do not understand Indonesia because of these 20 years, you know, uh, uh, freeze in our diplomatic relations uh, with China. Now, Indonesians probably still think China is the China in 1965, you know. Well, and, and similarly, the China might see Indonesia as, uh, as the one in 1965 uh, that they can, you know, uh, influence uh, uh, easily and so on. Uh, now that they become more democratic, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult. But you raise a very good point about the economic situation and the, the, the vaccine groupings that are popping up. Um, does that mean a country like Australia has lost an opportunity to perhaps pair its researchers in that field with Indonesian researchers or Indonesian industry, that's uh, the pharmaceutical industry, which is quite strong? And I'll, I'll leave that question open to anyone. Is that a lost opportunity now if China has come in and said, look, we'll work with you on building a vaccine? Um, I leave that question to Professor Wisely and Senator Wong. Is this the sort of collaboration that we should be thinking about? Well, I think, uh, Michael, do you want to go first? No, I'm happy for you to lead, Penny. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's take a step back. Uh, I, I think we are already seeing with the discussions uh, and actions around vaccine, the, a vaccine, the same sort of lack of cooperation and mistrust and, frankly, the sort of strategic use of, of um, capability uh, that has epitomised the uh, you know, it, non in the, in the inadequate res international response to the pandemic. So, if the question is actually, can we find a way to better collaborate around the manufacture and distribution of the vaccine? Uh, yes, that would be a good thing. Uh, I fear that the way in which you know, the, the discussion about um, what's happening with the vaccine is that, is, that, is that that point is being drawn into the same sort of strategic competition dynamic that we've seen 
um, mm. really undermining the, the international response to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Wesley. Look, I do think um, there are a lot of opportunities for greater collaboration uh, with Indonesia, and we need to, to look for all of those opportunities. Um, I, I guess as someone from the university sector, I think we can be doing a lot more in terms of building uh, research and education links with Indonesia. I think uh, these are some of the most effective ways uh, to build uh, diplomatic capital and social capital uh, across national borders. So I think there is a, a really big opportunity there that we should be looking very hard at. Thank you, Professor. And of course, the Australia Indonesia Centre would fully endorse those comments around research and collaboration. Without trying to be flippant, though, it, the questions are now around health and economy and how to pull forward out of the coronavirus pandemic. We have a very short amount of time left, so I'm going to ask you all to contribute just a very short response to uh, one question. And I'll start with you, Dr. Vermonte. Can you tell us, do you feel that there's still time for the countries, Australia and Indonesia, to find a way forward to get past some of the uh, weaknesses or vulnerabilities that have shown up in the coronavirus pandemic and work together to help both countries through it? Oh, we've, we, yeah. I think, yes, of course, uh, there will be time and then the, uh, then we need uh, you know people like Professor Weasley and uh, Senator Wong uh, you know and uh, people in Indonesia who know Australia you know well uh, so we can discuss uh, we know uh, we have our shared interest and then uh, Australia has been very good at investing uh, for example in the Indonesian education I was the grantee as you mentioned earlier and then the, this helped me understand Australia more uh, so we will we will have a uh, you know time but uh, if i may there are i th i think uh, there are i think uh, several areas that uh, needs to be thought of a bit between by indonesia and by australia number 1 i think we should really address the global health cooperation uh, about vaccines about the uh, cooperation uh, among our scientists uh, so we can you know work together because this is not i think the last pandemic that we will face there will be more and while at the same time the existing traditional threat remain, you know, the wars, South China Sea, and so on. So we are living in a very difficult situation with a very mixed uh, challenges that we need to, to think about. Number two, I think uh, regional organization and regional player uh, should play more important role in enhancing the capacity to deal with this kind of pandemic. WHO is a, a, is a global organization but uh, regional organization is in a better position to understand you know the, the 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 limits and the opportunity within the region so they can cooperate more to improve uh, our capacity to prevent to detect and respond to you know this kind of pandemics in the future and uh, again australia with uh, with its research cap capability uh, in indonesian the uh, scientists uh, i think we are uh, i think we are in a in a good position to 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 collaborate in this area and number three, I think, uh, if I may uh, reiterate my point, is that you know <clears throat> Australia can use you know the platform of the, of the, the dialogue partnership. You know, uh, ASEAN, Australia, New Zealand is one such mechanism. And uh, uh, I know that uh, some people in the, our foreign ministry have been thinking about uh, the way forward. And uh, I think we've been thinking about you know enhancing the cooperation of the ASEAN Plus mechanism. Uh, you know, uh, ASEAN with, with with ASEAN Plus three and uh, uh, with the ASEAN passes because, uh, as I said, you know, we cannot rely on the on the two superpowers uh, only, and and then we cannot rely on the global organization that is too big. Now it's time to think and strengthen our own uh, regional organization, in which Indonesia and Australia are two major players. Thank you, Dr. Vermonte, Senator Wong. I'll go to you. You've raise concerns about where the direction the world is going in? Do you think there is time for Australia and Indonesia to chart a different path? Uh, well, yes, uh, but I think perhaps more importantly, we, we have to. Uh, you know, you know the, 
the, the counterfactual of our failure to do so is not the status quo. The counterfactual of our failure to do so is a very different world and a very different region for us both. Uh, whether it's in the, in the context of, in terms of the pandemic, in terms of the economy, but in terms of the strategic order and the operating principles that exist within our region, uh, the counterfactual is not the status quo. So I think once you accept that, uh, then you've just got to forge your head together. Uh, and uh, I hope we can do that. And certainly that's, from my perspective, um, uh, and the Labor Party's perspective, it is a, a key and central priority. Thank you. And to you, Professor Michael Wesley. I think there's time, but I think the time is, is running out. Um, the good news is that in the past, when Australia and Indonesia have decided to collaborate uh, because of the stores of goodwill on both sides, it's been something we've been able to develop relatively quickly. So I do think it needs focus uh, from both sides of the Arafura Sea. Um, and I think uh, there is a lot to be done and a lot to be done uh, very quickly. Thank you. Uh, short answer is a good answer as we're ticking over the time that uh, we've taken, but uh, I think that's fine given the depth of the conversation. And thank you very much for answering those questions and joining us today to take questions from the audience as well. Professor Michael Wesley from Melbourne University, Senator the Honourable Penny Wong, of course, Leader of the Senate of the Opposition, and Dr. Phillips Vermonte from CSIS in Jakarta have been our guests today. We will have a recording of this webinar available later in the day. If you've signed up to this event, you'll receive notification of that. There's also a short survey if you have a moment to fill that out, that would be fantastic. We are, of course, now in our next series of webinars for the Australia Indonesia Centre and we've got a great one coming up in early August looking at data, the collection of digital information and how that works in something like the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, so much information out there but how do we use it? We'll look at how Indonesia has been using it and some ideas around uh, the ethics of use of data generally looking at both countries. Uh, we're also, of course, working from home at the moment, uh, as you can see, our panellists are as well. And so we thought a good chance to remind you that uh, our short film series called Real Oz In, which is a competition between Australian and Indonesian filmmakers, is actually now available online. We've got a great retrospective running. So if you are at home and you're looking for something fabulous to watch from some uh, emerging talent, then uh, please go to that. That's on our website, uh, australiaindonesia.org. Uh, um, Australia Indonesia Centre.org. Sorry, that's a long one. Uh, thank you again for your time. And as always, please get in touch if you have any further questions. I apologise that we didn't get through many, but hopefully we touched on some of the subject areas that are of interest to you. And looking forward to having you join us again. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Helen. Thank you.